Well, I started in radio in this very building uh, <clears throat> some years ago. My guest today started off in Yankton, South Dakota some years ago, and he ended up with ABC television at the United Nations. He was the only full-time correspondent at the U.N., for one of the major television networks. He's also a friend of mine. And it goes to show you, here I am all these years later, and there he is. He's not there anymore at, at the U.N., but we're going to talk to him about the U.N. Tom Osborne is my guest, and we'll be talking with Tom in just a moment. It's time for the Newsmaker Show on News Talk AM 1480 WLEA. Here's Kevin Doran. How would you like that put-down I gave myself, Tom? No, I thought that was good. I got a, I got a few inches up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, uh, we're going to talk about some of those people you knew at the UN, plus anything else you want to share with us, because you've gone on to other things too. But uh, this, what's his name, Sergey Lavrov? Is it Sergey? Yes, it's Sergey Lavrov. Yeah, he, he's the guy we see on television all the time with. Smiling John, John Kerry. That's right. He's now the uh, foreign minister. I knew him when he was ambassador to the United Nations. You know, he looks like a charming guy. And unlike the guys in the old Soviet Union who wore dumpy suits that didn't fit and looked dour, and they probably he, were dour. Well, uh, they were very dour. I should also mention uh, the, uh, the, 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 I guess, the paramount ambassador to Washington, uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, not Vladimir Putin, sorry. Uh, I'm getting a little confused here. Vorontsov, he had a very uh, very beautiful baritone voice. And uh, I remember uh, my uh, moment with him in the sun was when it was just about the time that the uh, Soviets uh, had uh, gone down the tube and Gorbachev had dropped off the keys uh, to Yeltsin. And Vorontsov was going around the corner into the Security Council the current ambassador, and I asked him, ambassador, very quickly, I said, what are you going to call it? And he said, well, I guess some sort of federation. <laughs> so that's what we ended up. I, I Actually, I ran with the story, new, uh, it's old, the USSR now, new Russian federation. Right. Well, of course, now there are some people who think that Putin is trying to make the old Soviet Union come back under a different name. Maybe not under communism, because even those guys didn't believe in communism. Uh, what do you think about that, Tom? Well, Kevin, I, I have to tell you, I'm, uh, I must tell you, we're working right now on a new launch of a new program called U.S. Uh, UN, and uh, U.S. UN is going to deal with U.S. foreign policy in the United Nations. And I consider this to be probably one of the Europe's greatest geopolitical crises that we've seen since the end of the Cold War. In a strange sort of way, uh, as I, I mentioned to you, I saw the end of the Cold War. Then we started the post-Cold War era, and uh, it seems to, to me now we're in the middle of between a Cold War and a Cold Peace. Uh, how we'll find our way through that will depend on just how much we can refrain uh, from taking the bait. It's very dangerous, very dangerous right now. Russia could disrupt the elections in May. They have 50,000 troops along the Ukrainian border. Uh, they have a very deeply held grievance over the loss of the Soviet Union. Putin has said so, and he intends to uh, make his path in that direction. So we've got our challenges cut out for us, in particular, new definitions of NATO. And the other point is that we can we depend on Russia uh, as a suitable partner in solving the regional and strategic issues? I'm talking about serious chemical weapons. We've got 82% of those about gone now. Will Russia follow through on that, or will we be stuck? Uh, there's the talks in Iran, of course. Russia can foul those up. Not to mention we have a lot of proxies, and we could have lots of uh, former Cold War uh, conflicts along that uh, Ukrainian border. Uh, so we're, we really have to be very careful. And the other uh, historical point, I think, I, if I can take a minute here to make this point. Please do. Uh, you know, we have two agreements that are in place here. In 1994, we have the Budapest Agreement was signed. Uh, we promised uh, to protect the Ukrainian borders. That was signed by Bill Clinton, John Major, Boris Yeltsin, uh, Leonid Kuchma. Uh, 
NATO is involved in that. We have Article 5 obligations uh, to uh, protect um, the Ukrainian borders, at least in terms of our promises under the Budapest Agreement. So the, the question is right now, where do we go from here? I, I'm a little bit, you know, stressed out at the fact that everyone is saying that, uh, you know, Obama drew this red line and he didn't maintain it. Well, there's different ways of looking at that. You know, we're talking about a treaty that was in force in 1997. Uh, that uh, was uh, endorsed by about 190 countries that drew that red line. So Obama uh, perhaps should have said, um, you know, I want to enforce the red line that we all drew. Um, and, you know, I do fault him on uh, perhaps how that was handled. But the point is that's our red line, all of our red line. It goes back to the uh, Geneva Protocols of 1925 on chemical weapons. So I just want to clarify that. And that's You're talking of, about Syria now, Syria. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm talking about uh, the, the chemical, yes, the chemical weapons in Syria. But, of course, we need, desperately need Russia's help on this. Uh, you, you know, back uh, when we were battling Saddam, uh, Russia was our, our key there, too. And uh, it wasn't until they made uh, Saddam move that he moved. I can, I can tell you a quick story. I was sitting above the, uh, the ambassador from Russia who was talking uh, to the uh, Iraqi ambassador, his counterpart just below me, and I overheard. Uh, and by the way, this was Lavrov <laughs> back then, and he said, you know, you can't just stand in front of these places and say there's no weapons in there. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. So I knew that the, the Russians had been uh, really not, uh, they'd been backing uh, Saddam's uh, recalcitrance, uh, and all of a sudden they were pressuring him. So I have another headline. But uh, they do, they're very key in all of these issues for us right now, and I just have no idea of where we're going to go forward with them. That's why Obama has to be very careful. He's got to draw the line and be strong, and we've already thrown him out of the eight, uh, the, uh, the big eight, and now we're down to the, the G7. There's a lot of things that we can do. Um, that we haven't done yet, and they're still in our arsenal, and they're all short of military action. But once they cross that line in Ukraine and we see military action, all bets are off. Okay, now listen, let me back up. Uh, you said that Putin wants to restore the old Soviet Union. Where did he ever say that or write that? Well, he said that about, uh, I think it was shortly there, shortly after the he came to power. I believe, I don't have the exact date, but his words were very clear. He said, you know, it was the worst event of the 20th century, the breakup of the Soviet Union. And he has vowed uh, to more or less uh, create his own Asian group of countries. Uh, I, this is not realistic. He doesn't have that reach. He doesn't have the, the ability to do that. But on the other hand, you know, we have forced him in such a corner. That's the other consideration that we have to look at. Uh, you know, we've surrounded him. We nearly took Ukraine. We, well, we talked about taking Ukraine into NATO. I mean, that's just not going to happen. We can't do that. The worst possible solution is what the Russians are suggesting now, that uh, Ukraine be broken up into several federal federations, which would allow them to pick them off one at a time. So that's another red line for us. Okay, now let me let me go back to something which I seem to recall, that when the Soviet Union fell... And was it, what year was it? Uh, it was about 90. About, about 90. In, 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 yeah. in about 91. Yeah. Okay, 91 is the year I had in mind. The uh, United States promised Yeltsin or Gorbachev, whoever was there at the time, that we wouldn't move NATO up to his borders. And we broke that promise right. by putting Estonia and Lithuania and Latvia in there and even talking about putting the Ukraine in there. Now, you know, if you're a Russian, you don't want NATO right on your border, right? Absolutely not. So he's got a complaint there, hasn't he? He does have a complaint, uh, I think, Kevin. Uh, you know, the point is that uh, there have been a lot of loose ends since the USSR fell apart. So here's a guy who has actually put the country together, you know, to his credit. Uh, at least his good friends are making money. Uh, and, uh, you know... But the fact is, the, the uh, West has, has repeatedly pushed him uh, to this point, uh, not that he has any right to, uh, to violate international order, you know, treaties that he signed, um, but he does have a, he, he has an agreement, a point, and I think we have to talk about that. You know, there's a possibility of making Ukraine into uh, a 
functioning uh, sacred government protected by uh, us, if we wish, um, and it's possible to negotiate that. But I think at this point, you know, everybody's going to have to step back a lot. Uh, whether And I think we'll see indications of that. Uh, as long as he continues to have these troops uh, massed on the border, this is an, obsolete, an ab- obvious escalation that is, is really unnecessary. So okay. I think that's... Tom, a lot of people say, I must tell you, I feel this way too, Crimea belonged to Russia for a couple hundred years. Khrushchev, when he was probably half in the bag, being Ukrainian himself, said, well, let's give this to Ukraine. So he gave Crimea to Ukraine when it was all part of the Soviet Union. So the Russians saying, wait a minute now, hold it. Now we got a new ball game on our hands. The United States overthrew our buddies in Kiev, which we did. Like it sure did, didn't it? Yeah. And, you know, he's got a right to be ticked off about that. So taking Crimea back, that I can understand that. Um, it's the way he did it, though, Kevin. I think, you know, we, have, we all have, I, it's, I, I think we have to look behind that, that move a little bit because, as you say, he was making a point. Uh, that point could have been made within international law. It could have been achieved. And I, I suspect that we were moving in that direction with the Russians. But uh, when the revolution top, toppled Yakanovich, that was really the, uh, the, the, the camel's back was broken on that one. Uh-huh. I don't think he could stand by. Uh, I, I wouldn't justify his actions, but, I mean, he did have, he had to act in some way. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we had hopes that he would work with us and that we could have worked this out, uh, but that he... he canceled all that out the minute he did. We can do a lot more. I mean, there, we also have to think about the Baltic states. The Poland, well, that's the one that scares you, because we have a, very, very we have a treaty with Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, which yeah. among them could probably put a 200 guys into the field. So we've got we've got to come to their rescue if he goes right. after them. This, you know, this goes right back to World War I, Tom, entangling alliances. That's what yeah. set the whole world on fire. Absolutely. And it and, scares you, know, you when you think about it. And you've got all these, and I, you know, I mean, it's. I'm trying to be objective about this, but I you've know. got all these, you know, these neocons, cha- uh, champions, oh. bit, you know, this yeah. old Cold War stuff. Let's go do this. There's lots of things we can do before that. I mean, we do have defense treaties. These Central and Eastern Europe defense is right in our door. Uh, you know, Poland, the Baltic states, all of that is it's very, very frightening. I mean, the point is uh, that we have to probably begin sending equipment and small arms to the Ukraine. And if we have to, we could shut down the Russian embassy. No visas for Russian officials or families. We could also, no visas for government officials. We move in in that direction. Then there's international restrictions, the IMF, uh, travel restrictions on World Bank officials. I mean, it goes on, but the point is, uh, I think we need to step back from this war rhetoric, you know, this Mm -hmm. business. I, I, I would only remind our listeners of this. That only 50 years ago, if you remember, we celebrated a little over 50 years ago the anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And at that time, President Kennedy gave our chances 50-50 of a nuclear exchange. We didn't realize that now, uh, until now, actually, after these papers have been opened. But if you think about it, you know, looking back 50 years, um, it hardly seems that the world should be lost over Cuba at that point. Uh, I mean, really, these things can be so blown out of proportion. And I, and I think that's the direction we're going in. And I think the meeting that they had in Paris with Lavrov uh, and uh, Kerry uh, over the weekend was very helpful. Um, it didn't really move the ball too much, but at least we are in negotiations and we can put, the, put to rest any sense of breaking up uh, Ukraine into a federation. I mean, these lines need to be drawn. I think that's probably what happened. Plus, I'd love to know where we stand on the chemical weapons in Syria, whether they will help us finish that job or not. Uh, I suspect they talked about that as well. Tom, we have to take a break. You remember those days. We'll be back in just a moment. I have a friend on the phone, Tom Osborne, former ABC correspondent at the U.N., the only television network that had a full-time correspondent at the U.N. He got to know a lot of stuff. He's not there anymore. He's working. What are you working on now, Tom? Um, We're working on a new uh, program called U.S.-U.N. Report, which focuses on uh, U.S. foreign relations specifically. 
in the United Nations. Okay. You know, some polls out in the last week or two indicate that the American people know that we're a weaker nation under Obama. They don't seem to care. They don't want us getting involved in any more wars. George Bush kind of cured us of wars, I think. Uh, so let's suppose that Putin does push and push and goes too far. Would the American people support going to war under NATO, which was set up to stop communism? What do you think? I wonder. I really wonder. Uh, I suspect yes. I think most Americans understand uh, this red line. I mean, in the sense of Soviet, or, I say Soviet aggression. Most people are old enough to understand and remember that Soviet aggression. Uh, they know that historically this is a no-go, cannot stand. Uh, whether we want to go to war, I don't know. I certainly, if we had to gear up, yes, I do believe that we would have the American people's support. Uh, but it would have to be very clearly spelled out. And I hope that Obama is moving in that direction, because that's where we have to go. We have to spell it out to the, Soviet, to the Russians, and we have to spell it out to the American people, so they're on board and know how serious this is. Some people argue that at a time when the Americans have a very weak president, they say, the Russians have a very strong president. Uh, Obama is not as sharp as Putin, many people say. What do you think? I think it's difficult be president of the United States in this day and age. As you say, we've got some stellar examples of doing exactly what we'd like to do in this world, and we know that that doesn't pay. We can't afford to do that. Um, we know that we can do things that George H.W. Bush did. Uh, the coalition that he assembled was brilliant, mm -hmm. and we accomplished our purpose and we withdrew. I think that's the lesson we need to bring forward. Our president is as weak as we make him in a lot of ways. I think the criticism we're getting from Congress in this crisis is really kind of overstepping the line. I think the president deserves to hear all sides, but uh, he's really in an impossible situation. The other thing is he's doing so much behind the scenes, and I wish that that somehow could be talked about. I know about it, you know about it, uh, but it's difficult to talk about every piece of the negotiations going forward. I think he's doing everything that we possibly can to avoid a war, and that's what we have to look at. Well, you know, I'm glad you, uh, I, I'm glad that you mentioned the neocons and the itching to go to war. Of course, they'd go to war with anybody. I've often said... <laughs> If, Someone said Hillary was a neocon. Is that right? I don't know. If if McCain had been elected, we'd have been in war with countries we didn't even know existed. I mean, the guy is, he's, really, that's all he wants to do, he and Lindsey Graham. And as a result of that, no one takes them seriously anymore. I grew, I grew, up, I grew up with a father who he flew so many missions in World War II. I can't remember the number, 30-something, and... Uh, we talk about these things all the time, and whenever I want to know if McCain's overboard, I just ask him, and uh -huh. uh, he kind of rolls his eyes. Yeah. I mean, these guys who've been to war know what it's like. Yeah. You would think uh, McCain would, yeah. Well, you know, exactly, and uh, they, they, they feel like they're in a position where they can criticize somebody like that. But, One of my announcers just put a question before me. If Reagan were president today, which would be rather difficult since he's dead, would Reagan be popular, or... Have we undergone a base change? Hmm. What if, if, I'm sorry, what was the last part of that question? I couldn't read it too well. Or have, has, has, is there a voter base change? There you go. That's oh, it. I see. No, I don't think so. I think Reagan had the sense of the country. Uh, he had a good balance of what, when we needed to ramp up and when we, we needed to talk up and talk down. I, I think that's, he had a sense about that, and he was brilliant at in his execution of foreign policy, too. Times uh, people criticize him for laying back and other times too aggressive, but I think he had a good balance. We need a president like that. Oh, yeah. Bring back and, the uh, Gipper. Listen, I think the Gip, I think he would have handled this just pretty much closely to what Obama's doing. I, you know, I happen to agree with you on that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Listen, Tom, we have to go, but stay okay. on the line just a moment. My guest has been Tom Osborne, a friend of mine. Tom, unlike your host, went up. <laughs> he became the number one 
television correspondent, the only one, in fact, at the U.N. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I'm sure if you saw his picture right now, you'd say, oh, yeah, I remember that guy. Well, uh, Tom is doing other things these days. He's had a very interesting career. And I think the last time he was on the show a couple of years ago, we talked about some of the things that have happened to Tom. Um, But we'll do that another day. Now stay tuned for news and information on AM 1480. WLEA, where news comes first. WLEA, where news comes first. WLEA, where news comes first.